Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, thank you for being here on this uh, wonderful, cold, beautiful winter day here in Hanover to talk about the Arctic, a place we all love and admire. Um, I'm Ross Virginia. It's my honor and privilege to direct the Institute of Arctic Studies here at Dartmouth. And the Institute of Arctic Studies is a unit of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Martin Jeffries as our speaker today. Um, Dr. Jeffries just recently joined Krell. I think probably everyone in the room knows Krell as the US Army Corps of, of Engineers Cold Regions Research Engineering Laboratory, located just to the north, of, uh, just a short walk from this place. Um, and Martin, Martin has had a very distinguished career in a number of areas that connect to our interests and, and Krell is, is uh, wonderfully lucky to have him join them um, as of this fall. Uh, Martin has a distinguished career as a researcher, as a leader in science administration, and also a major contributor to Arctic policy for the U.S. government and also internationally. Um, Martin started his career and spent approximately 30 years at UAF, 30 years on the faculty at University of Alaska Fairbanks in geophysics. And um, in that capacity, he had a very um, active and engaged research program, both in the Arctic and the Antarctic, where he, he studied um, the cryosphere. And in one of his emails to me called the cryosphere, quote, if I can find it here, that cold and icy stuff. So that may be technical jargon, but I, I think you get the sense that, that, that Martin has dedicated his career to understanding the dynamics of sea ice and glaciers and icebergs um, and all the implications of that. Um, after 30 years uh, in Fairbanks, he decided to uh, sample the good life in Washington, D.C. Um, and he's, he's had a number of very important um, positions in Washington. Um, he's, he's served in the capacity of science leadership for three different organizations, the National Science Foundation, the Office of Naval Research, and the U.S. Arctic uh, Research Commission. And in that capacity, he was very engaged in setting the priorities for the science, but also in the funding of the science. And in that way, Martin has had a very major f impact on the kind of science that we have today and where science is headed in the future. Um, in the last couple of years, he's had a very interesting assignment. He moved into the uh, uh, White House Office of Science, Technology, and Policy, um, where he worked with the Obama administration on a very active, expanded Arctic policy and in that, in that role, he had a principal um, footprint impact on the first uh, Arctic Science Ministerial meeting and also on the uh, International Science Agreement, um, Cooperative Agreement for, for the Arctic nations. So um, it's really a pleasure to have Martin now here in Hanover and, and joining Krell, but also joining with Krell, with Dartmouth, to make the Arctic a more a, a better place and to understand more about the dynamics of this amazing environment. So this is sort of an introduction um, to the Dartmouth community of Martin. We were just talking about the last time we were together in this room was in 2007 for the Arctic Science Summit Week. So it's been a little too long, but it's wonderful to have you back, Martin. So Martin's going to be talking to us about the importance and the need for enhanced collaboration, particularly internationally, on these Arctic science challenges. So please join me in a warm welcome to Hanover for Dr. Martin Jeffries. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a great honor to be here, and I, I want to thank Ross for inviting me to do this and setting up this talk and the reception and, and dinner later. Um, I. I entered the United States in 1981 as a postdoc at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and it's quickly becoming apparent that I have a, an unconventional American accent. Um, <clears throat> and it's a British accent, not an Australian one or a New Zealand one, I hasten to add. Um, but I went, so I, I finished my doctorate at the University of Calgary in Canada. I lived there four years, and then they booted me out, and I, I went to Alaska. Um, and it quickly became apparent to me there that um, what a diverse 
research population there was just at the Geophysical Institute alone, but more broadly throughout the university. The Geophysical Institute at that time had a large number of um, Japanese researchers, plus quite a varied group from Europe. And then a, a flux of Russian scientists, students came through, and then Chinese. And I used to half joke that this was what made the Geophysical Institute special and contributed to its success was this diversity. Little did I know at the time that I was actually onto something. Um, and I'm, this will be a thread throughout my talk, is diversity in science, technology, engineering, math, if you will, the arts and humanities. I didn't bring my science march sign, I forgot. But I went to the science march in Washington, D.C., and I wore a sign around my neck that said, don't forget the arts and humanities. Um, because I think we can... I think we can get a bit hung up on how important STEM is, and we do that at the expense of the arts and humanities. So, early one September morning in 2016, it was the 22nd of September, I am an NPR listener, and the radio usually goes on fairly early, and at 5.07 that morning, the hidden brain... Um, came on with Shankar Vedantam. You've probably heard him and on The Hidden Brain. It's fascinating to listen to him and what the things he talks about. And that morning, he talked about, can an airline affect the direction of science? And the answer was yes. And what he described was a, a study that showed um, the consequences for science and science collaboration of before and after Southwest Airlines service began in cities throughout the United States. And the study showed that once Southwest Airlines, with its cheap fares, arrived in a particular city, then you saw a change in the authorship of, in this case, chemistry research papers in peer-reviewed journals. They became more diverse, at least in terms of partnerships between chemists, chem chemistry researchers, in different cities in the United States. So that alone was interesting to me uh, in the fog of 5 a.m. in the morning. But at the end of the, that particular hidden brain story, he referred back to an earlier story done about two and a half years previously on the question of does diversity on research teams improve quality of science? And he so I, I went back to the original, uh, which is still available on the web, and you can listen to it too. Um, and they talked about um, how geographic and ethnic diversity of research teams equates to higher quality research as measured by science citation indices in pub through publication. And I, they showed that over the last 20 years, the authorship of um, scientific papers has become more diverse geographically and ethnically, more international and so on. And the, the explanation for this is that the more diverse the backgrounds of people in terms of where they're from uh, and their nationality, their discipline and so on, this this challenges all of us to be in diverse groups because it's diversity of thought, life experience, and it forces us to listen and challenge even our own assumptions and be willing to compromise and see somebody else's point of view and so on. And they found that um, with these diverse teams, um, they, their, the papers were being published in... Um, higher quality journals, which is somewhat subjective, but every discipline has the preferred journals or not so preferred, and that these papers also had higher citation index scores, geographic and ethnic diversity. So you're probably wondering, what's that got to do with Arctic research, Arctic science, technology, engineering, mathematics? Well, this was the 22nd of October. Um, 
I don't sleep terribly well these days. Small admission and um, opening up myself there. But at this time, I was sleeping even less than usual because it was six days before the White House Arctic Science Ministerial that Ross mentioned a moment ago. And I was deeply involved in the preparation for this first ever Arctic Science Ministerial. So I was sleeping even less than I would normally. Um, it seemed to occupy every waking hour and many sleeping hours when I should have been sleeping but was awake. So the Arctic Science Ministerial was held on the 28th of September of 2016. It was held in this building, the Eisenhower Executive Office Building in Washington, D.C. There's the White House right there. So it's part of the White House complex, or campus as we prefer to call it. Anyone familiar with Washington, D.C. will know that this is a pretty old photograph because this is Pennsylvania Avenue and this is now a pedestrian-only area. And you can probably wreck the, the Detroit iron on the roads here too is a bit of a giveaway as well. Um, so I spent 25 very interesting months at the Office of Science and Technology Policy in this building on the fourth floor. And I, my time was occupied with two main activities. One was being part of a small team that organized the first ever White House Arctic Science Ministerial. And the other was as the executive director of the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, which I'll talk about a little uh, in a few minutes. Um, and, and what the nature of that particular activity was for me. So the, the first ever Arctic Science Ministerial was held in this very ornate room known as the Indian Treaty Room, um, which is located right across there. It, you look out of those windows right across the White House. And you can see the very ornate ironwork here, these tiles. I, I found it rather ironic that, that in a building built only 100 years after the uh, revolutionary war that it's tiled with English tiles from the Midlands, from Stoke-on-Trent. Um, <laughs> but I, I guess 100 years later, things have been forgotten, with friendlier terms and all that. This particular photograph is the day before the Arctic Science Ministerial in the afternoon of the 27th, when roughly 40 Alaska Native leaders and leaders of the Arctic Indigenous Peoples Organizations met here with roughly a similar number of senior US government leaders to talk about Arctic science and the Arctic Science Ministerial. What are the indigenous people's priorities in science? And what could we learn from them about um, indigenous knowledge, co-production of knowledge, community-based monitoring, and so on? What can we do? What do we need to do for scientists and northern residents to work together and be effective? So this is a, a very brief summary of the White House Arctic Science Ministerial. 25 governments, including the United States, plus the European Union, met on the 28th of September. They discussed um, four different themes that had been agreed on beforehand as, as the themes, the topics, the priorities, if you will, for this ministerial, the topics and subtopics under each of those four headings of research that needs to be done to better, to increase our knowledge and understanding of the rapidly changing Arctic and topics that no single country can hope to do that work alone. The changes that are occurring in the Arctic and their consequences are so huge that we need to collaborate. And that's what the ministerial was ultimately all about, was bringing together for the first time ever science ministers or their equivalents or nominees um, to talk about the rapidly changing Arctic and the work we need to do together to, um, to be able to increase our knowledge and understanding so we can respond appropriately. So what is happening in the Arctic? It's warming very quickly at more than twice the rate of the global air temperature increase. This is what's known as Arctic amplification of global warming. It's driven by the increase in greenhouse gases um, that we, mankind, have been pumping into the atmosphere. And the consequences in the Arctic are, as I say, amplified because the uh, air temperatures are increasing so much more rapidly. Oops in the Arctic, OK, 
compared to the global situation. And the map at the top, um, this is 2018. So this is very recent from the Arctic report card released in December. Um, this is the, the scale here. Well, it's degrees Fahrenheit, which I, don't, I still fail to understand after all this. <laughs> after I've lived, as Ross said, I've lived here in, since 1981, and Fahrenheit still bamboozles me. Um, but anyway, um, the, the redder the color here, the greater the warming. Um, and so you see this incredible warming over the highest latitudes of our planet. Permafrost is warming. This is a record or records from a line of boreholes from Prudhoe Bay, where still a significant amount of our oil in the United States comes from. And it comes down a pipeline to Valdez and is exported to the lower 48 from there. But along this line, these are all boreholes which, in which the temperature is measured uh, every year by uh, Vladimir Romanovsky at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And these are the temperature curves for the last 30, 40 years. And you see temperature is rising um, systematically uh, throughout all the boreholes. And the greatest temperature increases are in the northern end of the, uh, the line of boreholes. So permafrost is warming and thawing. Um, in some cases where it's ice rich, then it's also melting. But um, permafrost, solid rock can be permafrost, permanently frozen ground. We're not going to melt rock. So I try to avoid reference to permafrost is melting. Instead, it's warming and thawing. That's just me being pedantic, perhaps. But that's the scientist in me. Could you dim the lights a little, somebody? I wonder if somebody nudged them accidentally. And that's, I can see, how about you? Um, I want to thank Don Perovich for these two um, graphics here. Um, on the left, we have sea ice extent um, at the end of winter in black, which is this curve here, and the end of summer in red. And this is a um, 40-year record now. And we see that the extent of sea ice at the end of summer, which is typically mid-September, is greatly reduced compared to what it was um, 40 years ago and even further back. Um, and these are statistically significant regression lines. So this is a real signal here. Um, and on the right, we see that the age of the ice has changed greatly. Back in 1985, um, most of the ice cover was four or more years old. And at the end of summer, it was still very close to the coast. There wasn't a lot of open water north of Alaska. In March of 2018, just nine months ago, 10 months ago, you see most of the ice now is very young. It's in the one to two year range. There's very little of the four year or older ice. And this is at the end of summer. Sorry, this is winter, um, end of winter, but um, so I should have put up an end of summer slide, but there's a lot more open water in the Arctic at the end of summer, um, north of Alaska, north of Eurasia. Tremendous uh, retreat of the ice at the end of summer. And then, oh, so here's, uh, here's a good end of summer. Uh, this is the sea ice at the end of summer 2017. So here's Alaska. And this is open water here and all around here. So you can see how far away from the coast the edge of the ice cover is now at the end of summer. It's, it's hundreds of miles. And this is a good graphic for a little, another little scientific lesson. It's shown, the ice is shown as white, which has a, ice has a relatively high albedo. It's very reflective. So a lot of the incoming solar radiation is reflected back to the atmosphere. But water, if you go and look at, well, you can't right now because they're all frozen. But in the summertime, if you remember the ponds and the Connecticut River, the water appears dark. So it absorbs a lot of solar radiation and it heats. And so what we're seeing in the Arctic Ocean is tremendous um, heating of the surface waters of the Arctic Ocean. This is sea surface temperature increase. Again, in red to show it's getting warmer. Uh, this is a trend in degrees, fractions of a degree Celsius per year. 
um, but since 1982, so the best part of 40 years also. So the, the Beaufort Sea and the Chukchi Sea north and northwest of Alaska are where the real warming is occurring in the Arctic in terms of sea surface temperature because of the retreat of the ice cover. In this area, there may also be um, an influence from warmer Pacific waters coming up through the Bering Strait and getting to the surface. Um, we know that from physical oceanography studies. So quick summary, air temperatures are increasing, permafrost is warming and thawing, summer sea ice extent is decreasing, and as that happens, the age, which is a proxy for thickness, the thickness is decreasing as well as the age. And sea surface temperatures, SST, those are increasing in waters that were previously covered by sea ice for many, many um, per, uh, summers. So, okay, that's very interesting. A few examples of um, the consequences of warming in the Arctic, but um, what, does it, what does it mean? Um, are, what's happening elsewhere? Or are there subsequent related effects from, from these changes? How might permafrost and sea ice change be related? So, um, with this opening of the Arctic by the end of the summer and all that open water, we now have a tremendous fetch, an expanse of open water that can be influenced by the wind. So the water surface is being whipped up and is becoming wavier. And we see here a record from basically 1990. This is derived from satellites that wave height, the wave height is increasing in the Beaufort and Chukchi Seas north and northwest of Alaska. But wind speed hasn't changed. So that tells you it's a fetch effect. Because the sea ice is retreating, we have more open water. For the same wind speed, you're going to get greater wave height. Um, so this is the kind of condition that would make me feel very ill on a ship, um, which I did for many years working in Antarctica. Um, I would get on a ship in New Zealand or Australia or South America, Chile, on the Magellan Strait, and then grit my teeth and cross many, many miles and days of open water in the Antarctic Southern Ocean and just wish it was all over. Um, I have a very weird inner ear, I can tell you. Um, but it's great when you get to the sea ice because <laughs> sea ice is a fabulous filter of waves. And once you're in the ice, everything's forgotten and you can become normal again. So we have greater wave height and we have warmer surface waters. And they're impinging on a coastline that is warming too. This is a permafrost coastline and the, the coast is getting warmer. Those, this is now warmer. So it's, it's more likely, it's more sensitive to external forces like warmer, wavier water. So we have very rapid coastal erosion. You can see this very ice-rich piece of uh, land here that's um, broken off and tipped into the ocean and will subsequently be, uh, it will melt away and be transported away. And you see these blocks here uh, similarly. And in some, this is on the north slope of Alaska, the tundra here. And in some places, the rates of erosion are tens of meters per summer. So it's a, it's a real problem. Um, why? People live on the coast in Alaska and elsewhere in the Arctic. This, this, is, um, this is Kivalina in northwest Alaska. This is Kivalina as well. This is Shishmaref, also the same region. But these are um, Alaska native villages, primarily native people, live in these villages. These, they didn't build here just because it seemed like a good place. These are sites that have been occupied for thousands of years. And they were forced to put down roots, permanent roots, in these locations. Um, and now they're experiencing the consequences of being less mobile than they once were because of coastal erosion and the wave, due to wave action. 
Um, you notice here at Shishmaref, these, these are not natural boulders. They were put there by my parent organization, the Corps of Engineers, to protect the coast, and they were destroyed. The coastal protection was destroyed. Um, the forces of waves and ice are very difficult to protect from. So these villages are in very precarious situations in, in some cases. So to summarize those few examples of what's changing and why it matters, uh, again, air temperatures, permafrost, ice, sea ice and sea surface temperatures are changing. Ocean fetch and wave heights increasing. Coastal erosion rates are increasing. This has an impact on people who live in villages and communities on the coast. 10 years ago, the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, did a report on Alaska villages and the precarious situations they find themselves in. And there were 31 that were judged to be under imminent threat from coastal erosion. And 12 of those had already decided to relocate. There's been no change for the better in these numbers. The situation is as bad, if not worse, than it was 10 years ago. And to this day, no single village has relocated entirely. Only one has really begun the process. That's Newtok, um, which is on the Bering Sea coast. They've sort of partially relocated. And the, the estimates for the cost of relocation vary from 100 to $500 million. Um, it's an immense amount of money. Um, and of course, it all adds up if they were all to be relocated in some way. But somehow we find that money for towns and cities on the coast in the lower 48 here that seems so much more difficult to help out native people in Alaska. Change is not only affecting the Arctic and people who live in the Arctic, but those Arctic changes, they come back and affect us in the lower 48 and elsewhere in the world too. There are mid-latitude effects. Um, you, some of you, I'm, I'm sure, I know, will have heard about the changes in the polar vortex and the jet stream. Um, we all experience the jet stream because everyone travels by air in this room, I'm sure. And if you travel west from here, you're traveling against the prevailing wind, the jet stream. The jet stream happens to occur where most jet aircraft fly around 35,000 feet. So you're beating your head against the brick wall, if you will, when you travel west. It's great when you come back east that you've got a tailwind and you can, you can be back from Seattle or LA, San Francisco quite quickly or in 30, even 60 minutes quicker going from the west coast to the east coast than going east to west. You're benefiting from the jet stream. So this is a, well, whatever normal is these days, but this is a fairly normal jet stream. But because, well, the hypothesis, shall we say, is that because the Arctic is warming, the temperature gradient between the Arctic and lower latitudes, that temperature gradient is weakening. And that weakens the jet stream. The jet stream is maintained by a strong, cold, warm contrast between the Arctic and the mid-latitudes. And with the Arctic warming, that contrast isn't quite what it was. And so the jet stream is weakening and becoming more wobbly, as you see here. This is January the 5th, 2014. Um, this is the previous fall in, in November. And so it wobbles and the cold air pushes south into, for example, the lower 48, but also elsewhere around the northern hemisphere. And this, in 2014, this was when there were the big headlines about, oh, the polar vortex is here, and, and so on. And at least people learned the term polar vortex and something of what it meant, um, because it was darn cold in the lower 48. They were freezing in the dark in Alabama and the Gulf states, for example. And um, in Washington, D.C., um, the Potomac River froze over completely. This is not a glacier. This is the Potomac River at Key Bridge, uh, which connects Georgetown to Rosslyn in Northern Virginia. Um, 
I took this when I was walking home one day from, uh, from my job at the Office of Naval Research. And this is 2010, February 2010. This is Snowmageddon, as you may recall that term being used um, because, of course, Washington, D.C. ground to a halt because I forget how much snow there was. It was a lot. It fell. It be, the storm began on the Friday afternoon. It snowed all day sun, Saturday, and then the sun came out on Sunday, and those of us who cared to get out in the snow, we went out to go and see what, what does Washington, D.C. look like in the snow. It was fabulous. You can see here the National Mall, the Washington Monument, the Smithsonian Castle, and the uh, Natural History Museum there. This is taken from Capitol Hill from Congress. So the warming Arctic affects the rest of the world in terms of temperatures, precipitation, drought, heat, and, and so on. And there's growing evidence that this is occurring more frequently as the Arctic uh, warms. And then the other um, global effect of Arctic warming is um, the melting of glaciers, ice caps, and the Greenland ice sheet. There's uh, significantly more melting going, occurring on the Greenland ice sheet alone, and uh, many glaciers outside of Greenland are shrinking in terms of mass. They're retreating in length, thickness, and thus a great deal of mass loss too. Um, and you see here, these are meltwater streams in summer on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet. That is a person for scale. So you can see the immense size of this um, cut made in the ice surface by this relatively warm meltwater. And here, the water is uh, heading down what's known as a moulin, which is um, an opening in the ice, a mill, literally. Moulin is French for mill, where the, ice, the water goes down into the interior of the glacier and can find its way to the bed. And that lubricates the bed and can speed up the ice loss by motion. And this is an example of what happens when the ice speeds up on its way to the ocean and you get icebergs carving into the ocean. This is a very... Uh, I think this was from last summer when there was, um, you may have re remember the, port, the reports about, the, I think this village was evacuated because there were worries about this iceberg breaking up and causing local tsunamis that might harm the village and of course the people uh, who live there. And then here's the, uh, the graphs and charts. This is from 2012, July 1st in 2012. Um, remote sensing from space, um, the blue is where melting on the ice surface was detected, and the white is where it remained frozen, if you will, no melting detected. Eleven days later, you see that blue melting detected at the ice surface dominates the ice sheet, including the highest elevations down the spine of the ice sheet, and that's Remind me, Mary, 3,000 meters roughly, I think, is the highest elevation in Greenland at summit. So 3,000 meters, 10,000 feet, that's a long way up. Um, you might get dizzy if you spend too long up at that elevation. <clears throat> and then this graph here is a graph of the change, the declining, rapidly declining mass of the Greenland ice sheet as measured from space by the GRACE satellite. This is a joint NASA and German space agency mission where they use the changes in the gravity field of the Earth's surface. And the, the gravity field varies according to where the mass is distributed. And so they, the satellites, there's a pair of satellites um, following each other uh, in space, and they detect these gravity shifts due to the changing mass, and they've detected this incredible change in mass in the Greenland ice sheet since the mission began uh, 17, 18 years ago. And so there's a change in mass, and you know, I'm, I'm a science geek, so I see more in this graph as well. And interesting, you see the seasonal change in mass because in wintertime, snow accumulates. So you add to the mass, and then that snow melts, and then the ice below it melts, and then you lose mass in the summer. And it goes through this seasonal cycle, but it never recovers to the previous winter mass maximum. It's every year 
It's been declining further and further. Unfortunately, uh, we now have a GRACE follow-on mission launched um, in the fall that we will be able to extend this record and continue to monitor the, the health, if you will, of the Greenland ice sheet. And I'll stick my neck out and suggest we're probably going to see this continue to decline. <clears throat> and that, I'm not being a pessimist. I think it's just realism. Okay, so shameless self-promotion. Um, if you're interested in what's changing in the Arctic, in the cryosphere, in the biosphere, um, different aspects, different components of the Arctic environmental system. Um, you can learn about this from the annual report card, which is not available on right, online right now because of the government shutdown. It's, uh, the Arctic report card is hosted on a NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration website, so it's down at the moment. When the government reopens and the lockout stops, then um, go to the Arctic report card or go to the State of the Climate Report, another annual publication, and there's an Arctic chapter in there, um, which is very similar to the Arctic report card. Um, so you can find this now. Um, wait till the government reopens and you'll find this. Quick plug for Sea Ice and Don Perovich, um, who's the lead author on that. Chris Poloshensky, former graduate, of, uh, of Dartmouth and the Arctic Igot um, that Ross ran for many years. So let's move on. I'll just go back. So the first Arctic Science Ministerial that, that was held at the White House, I was, um, my reward for being one of the organizers was to spend the entire day sitting quietly in a corner witnessing the event, if you will. And uh, I had a number of hopes of that ministerial. And very high on the list was that after all that effort, it wouldn't be the first and last Arctic science ministerial. And so I sat in my corner quietly all day. And as heads of 25 different government delegations, plus the representative from the European Union, as they stood up during the day and made roughly five minutes of prepared remarks. Um, and then they, you know, they would discuss amongst themselves and so on. I sat there thinking, who's going to stand up and say, my country, X, we would like to host the next Arctic Science Ministerial. And the day is going on and on, and it's getting late in the afternoon, and I'm thinking, Come on, people, you know, this is too important. Um, and finally, the European Union, because it's not a country, um, it was the, the representative from the European Union was the last to speak. And her very last words were, the European Union um, is very pleased to announce that we are considering <laughs> organizing and hosting a second Arctic Science Ministerial. We're very impressed with this meeting. We feel it's very important that it continue at this high level, science minister or equivalent. And so I did a quiet yes. You know. <laughs> I also turned to one of my colleagues, John Farrell, the executive director of the US Arctic Research Commission. And I looked at John and I said, did I hear correctly? Because, well, so, Consideration turned to confirmation, and we had a second Arctic Science Ministerial in Berlin, Germany, at the end of October, or just a few months ago. And um, this was 26 governments this time, plus the European Union. It was co-organized by the European Union, Finland, and Germany. Um, they had three themes. They really, they dropped the education theme that we had for the White House Ministerial, not that they were saying education is unimportant, but they said education is implicit in all of this. Education is an implicit part of research. Fair enough. And then they just sort of reorganized the words in our other three um, themes, just to put their own little stamp on it. Um, it was a two-day event. We had an Arctic Science Forum on day one. That was for the scientists and the engineers and others 
to, to look back on what have we accomplished since the White House Arctic Science Ministerial and where should we be going um, beginning now, October 2018? What, do we have any new priorities, any new activities we should be um, collaborating on um, together? And then day two was the ministerial itself. These are the heads of the delegations, uh, including um, Arctic Indigenous Peoples Organizations leaders, such as uh, Chief Joseph here and others. The head of the U.S. delegation is Dr. Franz Cordova, the director of the National Science Foundation, uh, right here. And this is um, Carlos Moedash, the head of the European Union delegation. The others, I am not sure who they are, sorry. Um, so just as with the White House Arctic Science Ministerial, so with this ministerial, all the heads of delegations signed a joint statement that by signing, they made a commitment that their country, their government, would collaborate with others to push the science forward. But one item in the joint statement that I'm particularly pleased about because it gets back, well, you see it there at the bottom, that um, the, we had a working group for U.S. participation in the second Arctic Science Ministerial, and I was fortunate to be a member of that working group. So we were helping with the preparations for Dr. Cordova and the other two members of the U.S. delegation, Fran Ulmer, <laughs> who's the chair of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, and um, Tim Gallaudet, um, Navy two-star, sorry, one-star admiral, retired now, who is the head of NOAA, um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And so this working group, we did many, we were engaged in many different things, preparing for U.S. participation in the ministerial. One of those activities was um, reading and commenting on the numerous drafts of the joint statement. Because ultimately, everyone that's participating in the ministerial, they have to be able to say, we played a role in crafting it, and we agree to everything that's in there. And I'm particularly pleased about this statement here, that we, the United States, um, succeeded in convincing the other countries that not only was it important to refer to diversity and inclusiveness in Arctic science and why it matters, we got it on the second page of a seven-page statement, so it was pretty close to the front end. Um, and even, even science ministers can get past the first page, we, hope, we thought. So this was a, a great success. And if my European Union colleagues and, who organized this were sitting in that room with the same feeling I had at the White House Arctic Ministerial, hoping that someone was going to step up and say, we want to host the third Arctic Science Ministerial. Um, then their wish came true because it was announced that Iceland and Japan will co-organize the third ministerial in the fall of 2020, and it will be held in Japan. So we've gone from the United States, North America, to Europe, and now the next one will be in Asia. Geographic and ethnic diversity. So let's get a bit closer to home to the United States and Arctic research collaboration here at home. Um, there is a very short-ish short act of Congress called the Arctic Research and Policy Act, came out in 1984. Um, and this is my perhaps self-serving encapsulation of the act and what it says. But it created the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, USARC, to promote Arctic research and recommend Arctic research policy. And it created the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, IARPIC for short, chaired by the National Science Foundation. And its role is to develop US Arctic research policy based on the recommendations from the USARC and prepare a five-year plan to implement the policy. And that plan is known as the Arctic Research Plan. Bullet number three, slightly separate from all this because it ha we, we advance far into the future after 1984 when in 2011, IARPIC became a working group 
of the National Science and Technology Council in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House. This has been transformative, to borrow a word from, I think NSF still uses transformative, transformational. Um, let's just say that be between 1984 and 2011, um, IOPIC's level of activity and success went through waves, as so many things do. Um, but when you are invited to join the White House establishment, you have to do things. You can't sit back on your laurels and say, wow, we're in the White House now. Fabulous. Um, you have to actually show that you're doing good things for the administration, for the government, and for the nation. This was transformative because in 2012, IARPIC published the first ever Arctic Research Plan. Act 1984, IARPIC shall prepare a five-year plan, the Arctic Research Plan, finally did a real research plan in 2012 for the period 2012 through 2017. And there is now a second Arctic Research Plan 2017 through 2021 that's being implemented. This is IARPIC Research Plan number two for that period 17 through 21. These are the topics of the nine goals. I won't read them out. You can read that yourself. The full titles are somewhat longer, but this is the short um, description of each topic. Um, goals have research objectives and performance elements. And performance elements are specific tasks that we, the interagency, have set ourselves to work on together and make progress and report that progress. I should also mention that the plan has policy drivers, um, beginning with the people of the North, enhance their well-being, advanced stewardship of the Arctic environment, which you can translate into, if you will, improve our knowledge and understanding of the Arctic environmental system, strengthen national and regional security, and then the bigger picture, improve understanding of the Arctic as a component of our planet. One of my predecessors, Brendan Kelly, um, who was at the time with the National Science Foundation, um, Arctic Science Section, he was, he was the first um, assistant director for polar sciences in OSTP and the first executive director of IARPIC. And Brendan was responsible for bringing together that first Arctic research plan and a way to implement it. And this is the way that it was agreed by the White House and the lawyers and many others um, that we would implement that first Arctic research plan and which we continue to use to implement the current, the second Arctic research plan. And the platform is called IARPIC Collaborations. And you see the URL up here and I invite you to go to that URL, um, search for it using Google. It should come up top of the list, I hope. Um, but this, it's a website, but it's so much more than a website. It's really a web-based platform for collaboration. We sometimes speak of it as um, it's a social media platform for Arctic science. So IOPIC collaborations we used, we used to speak of it as an experiment when it first got going because there was nothing like it in the entire United States government. What set it apart and made it unique was it's not an exclusively federal government activity. Only federal government employees can write that plan. But there's nothing in the law says we have to implement the plan exclusively as a federal government activity. And that makes sense because there's a lot more Arctic science, technology, engineering, mathematics, arts, and humanities talent out in academia and elsewhere than there is actually in the federal government. 
So why not draw on that immense talent out there and bring together anyone and everyone who cares about Arctic research and wants to be engaged in implementing US Arctic research policy, give them a platform to work together, report together, advance Arctic research together. So there are many advantages and benefits to being part of this uh, collaboration. And this is just one example is you can report your work that may or may not be funded by the federal government. In all likelihood, it is. By some federal agency, there's quite a number that are actively engaged in uh, funding Arctic research. But say you have an NSF grant and you're studying vegetation on the North Slope of Alaska and maybe its relationship to permafrost, warming and thawing permafrost. There is, there is a performance element for you somewhere in this plan that you can report the results of your work. You might report, I'm back from the field and we spent six weeks studying this and we made these initial observations. Maybe a year or two later you report, we've just published three papers on this topic now. You can find those papers in the, this particular journal and so on. You can upload your PDF to the website and make it part of the permanent IARPIC collaborations record. So this reporting becomes part of the annual reporting by IARPIC to the National Science and Technology Council and OSTP. So by reporting, you can get your work in front of some important people. Our reporting by IARPIC is part of the reporting on the national strategy for the Arctic region. There is um, one of the objectives in that uh, national strategy is entitled uh, Pursue Responsible Arctic Region Stewardship. And under that title, um, there is um, another objective of, um, of combine science, technology, engineering, and mathematics with indigenous knowledge to advance our understanding of the rapidly changing Arctic. That's where IARPIC reporting fits right into the implementation of the national strategy. The, our annual reporting for IARPIC, we are required by law to report every two years to Congress. So these performance element reports and the annual reports become the, um, the raw material for a biannual report to Congress. And this, I gave an invited talk at the American Geophysical Union meeting in Washington, D.C. in December. And so this is just an example to the particular session, which was an Arctic Ecosystems uh, session, um, showing how what they were, I was the first speaker, and, and this was to show how the work you're about to describe to yourselves through the other speakers um, has already been highlighted in a report to Congress that was released in early 2018. So my next, okay, get involved in IARPIC collaborations. Become part of a community that's, that cares about the Arctic, cares about Arctic science, etc., and wants to work together to advance knowledge and understanding of our rapidly changing Arctic. It's very easy to get an account. And when you get an account, you go behind the public side of the site where it really gets interesting, where the true collaborations occur. Let's change tack a little um, and go back in time to 1942 and the construction of the Alaska-Canada Highway, the Alcan Highway, to connect Dawson Creek in Northeast British Columbia with Delta Junction and Fairbanks Alaska in the interior. It took eight months, March to October of 1942, which just goes to show that we really can get things done when you really need to get things done. Eight months to build a 1,700-mile highway through pretty much uncharted territory. The highway is somewhat shorter now because an awful lot of kinks have been ironed out of it over the years. And of course, it's entirely paved now. But it's no less of an adventure to drive. And if you ever get the opportunity, you should. It's fabulous. Do it in summer. Um, 
although I've done it in winter too, and that's pretty exciting. Um, and I've done the, I've been up and down the highway because I lived in Fairbanks for many years. Um, but this this was a learning experience because it had to be done in a hurry. They just flattened the forest wherever they went, bulldozed it. They used the logs to make corduroy, and then they threw dirt on top of that and so on and created a fairly crude dirt road. But, of course, they disturbed the permafrost. It was, a, let's say, an, a lesson in disturbing permafrost and how, if you're going to do that, you need to think about it. Of course, they were in a hurry. This was a national emergency, or I shouldn't use that term, sorry. Um, uh, um, but they had to build this road because it was wartime. The, the Japanese were invading the west end of the Aleutian Islands, U.S. territory. There was a great concern about invasion by uh, the Japanese invading Alaska. And then, of course, there was Lend-Lease and the aircraft flying from the lower 48 uh, to Russia, to the Russian Far East. Um, but um, they, they wrecked the permafrost and uh, learned very quickly about engineering in um, sensitive and polar environments um, because the road fell apart, became a morass. And you see these trucks are stuck in the mud. There's one here being bulldozed forward or out of the way. Others were towed, as you see here, and so on. Um, but I, bring, I put this down because this is where, this is Krell's heritage. This is where Krell got started. So here's, here's our campus, just north of town, 72 Lime Road, opposite the middle school, just here. And here's a quick chart of our heritage. So a permafrost division in St. Paul, Minnesota, a frost effects lab in Boston in the mid-40s. They combined to become the Arctic Construction and Frost Effects Lab. That lab combined with CIPRI, as we often call it, the Snow, Ice, and Permafrost Research Establishment in Illinois. That became Krell in New Hampshire in 1961. And we've been out on Lime Road ever since. And in 1999, we, became, we remained part of the US Army Corps of Engineers. But as part of a reorganization of the labs, we became part of the um, the Army Engineer Research and Development Center, ERDC or ERDIC. But we're still a Corps of Engineers organization. So our, our vision at Krell is to be the national resource for cold region science and engineering. My first day at Krell was the 17th of September. It was a Monday. And Dave Ringelberg here in the audience met me at the front door about nine o'clock, I think. And almost the first words out of his mouth were, Martin, deputy secretary or somebody in the army has declared that cold region science and engineering is now a core competency for the army. Meaning the army needs to know and do more with respect to cold region science and engineering. So I thought, well, that's great. I'm joining this lab at the right time. Somebody very senior in the Pentagon is saying cold regions, science and engineering matters. And it does. And our mission, as you see here, is basically solve scientific and engineering challenges in cold and complex environments to find effective and interdisciplinary solutions for the Army, DOD, and the nation. Interdisciplinary, you could translate that to diversity, if you will. We have five branches that you see here covering a broad range of disciplines, and we have one center of excellence in remote sensing and geographic information systems. Um, if, if I was in the technical staff, I would be in terrestrial and cryospheric sciences because I'm a cryosphere scientist um, who has done a little bit of research here and there on sea ice, freshwater ice, icebergs, and ice shelves. And then we have amazing facilities out at Lime Road. You can go and set fire to oil outside in the basins and learn about 
dealing with spilled oil in cold, frozen environments. We have ice engineering facilities where we have these big flumes and pools and you can create ice and you can test model ship hulls, for example, or the impacts of ice on structures that may be a coastline or it might be an offshore drilling platform or something. You can test them all at a reduced scale in facilities like this. Frost effects. Um, what's the, what are the consequences of frost heave on road surfaces, for example? How can you mitigate against frost heave? You can test these things in the frost effects um, facility. And effects of frost on runways and airstrips. And, so, and then material evaluation. How, how well are materials and platforms, vehicles performing in the cold? We also have people in Alaska. We mustn't forget the small number of people, a dozen researchers and staff at Fort Wainwright in Fairbanks, Alaska. A small number of people plus some amazing facilities. Again, nothing quite like it. Well, there is nothing like it in the United States or Canada. Maybe elsewhere in Europe um, and uh, Asia, there might be something similar, but still very special facilities that really Krell um, owns, and there's nothing really like it anywhere else. One is we have a many acres for a permafrost experiment station uh, just, just outside Fairbanks um, on Farmer's Loop Road, um, where it's possible to investigate the consequences of interfering with the permafrost, if you will, or how to keep permafrost frozen. These are thermosiphons, um, which is a way of refrigerating the ground below the surface, keeping it frozen. These thermosiphons, for example, there's, there's probably hundreds of them on the Trans-Alaska pipeline, keeping the ground frozen a ground, uh, around the metal stands on which the, ice, the pipeline sits above ground. And the pipeline is above ground for many, many of the hundreds of miles of, of its total 800 mile length. We also have this amazing permafrost tunnel research facility, which is undergoing expansion. For many years, it was a single tunnel. This is the original. And I've been fortunate to go in here a number of times when I was living in Fairbanks. Um, but we now have a second tunnel adjacent to the first and eventually it's going to make a U-shape. They'll be connected. And you can go in here, you can see bones from woolly mammoths and ancient 10,000 or older, year, year older animals. Um, ancient vegetation is hanging from the walls and the ceiling. There are all sorts of microorganisms caught up in the permafrost, which great raw materials for genomics research and similar um, scientific investigations. Um, you can see ice wedge polygons in there, big masses of ice um, with the sediments in between separating them and so on. So another great research facility available to Krell researchers and others. It's not exclusively for Krell. So finally, a few words about Dartmouth College and Krell. Um, I want to make a quick um, caveat about this. I, I wrote these bullets out before I learned that just a month ago, in December, Dartmouth and Krell uh, co-signed an education program agreement, an EPA, um, to encourage, promote collaboration between our two organizations. Or really, it's formalizing or re-signing an earlier agreement, which made possible a lot of collaboration already between the two organizations. And a lot of that organization revolves around students. And students being able to work with Krell technical staff, um, to work on their projects, to pursue their own research at the lab using those facilities that we have available. Krell personnel to be on student advisory committees, um, guest lectures, perhaps even substitute lectures if, 
if you have if if a Dartmouth faculty member goes on sabbatical, maybe there's someone at Krell who could stand in to to give a class, of course. But we uh, Krell would really like to continue what's been a very rich collaboration over the years. I think with Dartmouth, I think there's probably more we can do. We just haven't thought about it yet. Um, but we have these great facilities where faculty, staff, and students from Dartmouth can come and work with Krell folks and work in facilities which, as I say, there's really nothing like them anywhere else in North America, for sure. And I'm getting long in the tooth now. Um, you can see I'm gray. And, and I think about our research community. And, and I see some of my polar research colleagues in, in, the, uh, in the room who I've known for many years. And, and I think about the possible aging of our Arctic and, and Antarctic research community. And we need to keep feeding the lower end with younger, clever, innovative, creative researchers. And I think the, a partnership between Dartmouth and Krell can play an important role in feeding that pipeline through the two organizations working together, taking advantage of the, um, the infrastructure, the hardware we have at Krell, and then the, the education um, organization known as Dartmouth, where you have your own research programs, and faculty who are also interested in the Arctic and may be looking for collaborations. Uh, for themselves, their students, and so on. So that's the end of my, my talk. I just draw your attention uh, to this particular photograph, because I think this, to me, exemplifies Krell talent and innovation. This is a C-17 Globemaster aircraft, the largest aircraft in the Air US Air Force um, it, I was looking online this morning for something equivalent in the civilian airliner, and it, in terms of empty weight, it's about the size of a 757, a Boeing 757. Um, so it's a, it's a big lump of aircraft. And this one is taking off at McMurdo Station, Antarctica. It's a wheeled aircraft, no skis, and it's taking off on compacted snow. And Krell made that possible. Krell engineers and others made it possible to land monster aircraft and take off again on compacted snow runways in Antarctica. And I, I have been to the predecessor of the Phoenix airfield. It was called Pegasus on one of my trips in and out of McMurdo a number of years ago. And I, I flew in and took off on a, on a C-141, which is a slightly smaller Boeing aircraft than that one, but it's still a big lump of gray metal. And it's pretty awe-inspiring to think you're in a wheeled aircraft landing on snow. This is the type of activity that students, staff, and faculty at Dartmouth could get involved in developing through collaboration with Krell and others. So I'll leave it there. That's my advertisement for Krell over. I'll, I'll shush. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, so we have time for two questions. So we have a microphone here, so. I, I can speak loudly. No, we, we were recording this. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. I have a couple of uh, questions. First, I've always been curious about the uh, political support for having Krell in Hanover. Do you know who was the genius, the pol political genius who helped get it created here? That's number one. Number two is I, I appreciate the research and the collaboration that has always gone into this project, but I'm curious about whether the private sector, and I'm thinking mainly of philanthropy uh, organizations, since we are now in a crisis, have not been uh, uh, able to come to the task in a way that would not only help the research, but the dissemination of the research in a way that would educate the public in a more positive way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
So I don't know the answer to your first question. I've wondered about that myself, and I need to do a little bit of research, but I can't help feeling that it was maybe a senator or a congressman for New Hampshire that played a role in getting the lab here. Was it? OK. There we go. Um, it was supposed to be in Florida, because the Air Force had a big hangar they could put bombers in so cold, the cold soak them to 60 below zero. Oh, right. I think that's still Bridges, uh, from New Hampshire said, Cold regions, laboratory, Florida, and the rest of the system. Thank you. So, yeah, can I add to that slightly? Yeah, thanks. And then part two, um, the philanthropies, the philanthropic organizations. Or corporations. Or corporations, yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about philanthropy first. Um, there are a number of philanthropic organizations, foundations, who are interested in the Arctic and supporting Arctic research from an indigenous people's perspective. And this includes the Oak Foundation, the Moore Foundation, and others. And um, they've come together, actually. Um, I think they call themselves the Arctic Philanthropies. And they provide awards, grants, to Nat Alaska Native organizations and others, um, universities. Um, who are going to work with Alaska Natives and others to, to advance the, the role of bringing indigenous knowledge more into our research, our so-called Western science, you'll hear it referred to as. So definitely some of the philanth philanthropic organizations are interested in uh, the Arctic. They recognize the importance of the changes occurring in the Arctic, how they affect the people of the Arctic, and they want those people the indigenous peoples primarily to be more engaged in science and finding solutions to the challenges. Um, the private sector, well, I can, I can give examples, for example, um, in the 1970s and the 1980s in particular, the, uh, the energy sector poured an immense amount of money into Arctic research um, because of off offshore exploration and the promise of vast oil and gas wealth offshore, so there was a lot of money invested in sea ice research. And some of that money flowed to Krell and Jackie Richter-Mengi here um, was one of the beneficiaries of that in the um, late 70s and early 80s. Right now, um, the, the private sector, they're not actually very active in terms of exploration in the Arctic. Um, the current administration would like to see that change. Um, but the, the private sector, certainly oil and gas, uh, um, not investing a lot in Arctic science at the moment. You brought up the uh, topic of um, permafrost disruption. And that got me to thinking, I've been to many of these places myself, in particular in uh, I have been on that airplane, um, and I've also been to uh, Fairbanks a fair amount, where I know that there was, of course, a lot of gold mining, which very much disrupted the terrain there. And I'm wondering how that is as a study of permafrost disruption and whether the, the uh, now warming of the climate might be um, destabilizing the the um, damage that has been done way back when. That's that's an interesting point. Um, just around Fairbanks alone, there was a tremendous um, amount of gold, not exploration, it was exploitation, gold removal by dredging. And um, it, it could not be done that way today. We fortunately have better environmental rules, but gold dredging was it did horrible things to the landscape. It just tore it up. And, um, and you see the consequences of that in the landscape. Aerial photographs in particular look f quite amazing of the, the areas where gold was dredged around Fairbanks and Dawson City and in, the, in Yukon Territory and so on. So tremendous environmental degradation by um, the gold dredging. Um, and I suppose you could, you could look at that, and uh, it's analogous in a way to the 
some of the changes that we're seeing in the landscape now due to warming and thawing of the permafrost, which is, it, it's not just warming and thawing of the permafrost, but that leads to um, subsidence. Um, as the land collapses, that changes the hyd surface hydrology, even the subsurface hydrology. That leads to changes in vegetation. That leads to impacts on um, wildlife. And that affects people as well. So it, it's all a system. And that's what makes Arctic science so interesting to my mind, is if you are willing to, to see the bigger picture, okay, we all have a particular focus and a particular experience and expertise of the thing we want to do our research on. But I think if you place that research, your particular strength or topic in a broader context, it just makes it so much more interesting. And permafrost thaw, warming and thawing is an example of, of how things ripple out and there are these many consequences, some of which I don't, we probably don't know about yet. Um, I'd be interested to know your estimate of how much our country's research on Arctic climate has influenced our policies on climate in general. Uh, and also, I'd be interested to know how organizationally your results and policy recommendations filter their way through into more general climate policy. Okay, can I take a drink of water? <laughs> I was, so as I mentioned earlier, I spent 25 months at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Basically, that half of it was during the Obama administration, and then I was asked would I stay on for some similar period of time beginning of the current administration. You may remember President Obama's inaugural address in January 2009 when he said something to the effect, we're going to put science back where it belongs, informing policy. And he was deadly serious about that. And he brought in to head the Office of Science and Technology Policy to be the director, uh, John Holdren. Not only was John Holdren the director of OSTP, he was also senior advisor to the president for science and technology. They're not one in the same position. He had both. So Holdren was in a privileged position with a president who was dead serious about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Holdren met with the president at least once a week sometimes more often. He had the president's ear, and as a consequence, what was going on out in the world, the broader world of science and research, was reaching the president's ear, and it was being acted on as part of broader government policy. In, in the case of the, the Arctic, um, President Obama was the first sitting president to visit the Arctic. Um, many presidents have visited um, Elmendorf Air Force Base in Anchorage because they were on their way to the Far East and they'd stop in and refuel and shake a few hands of um, important people in Anchorage. But President Obama was the first to go north of the Arctic Circle. He spent, he spent an unprecedented three days away from the White House in one place, Alaska. And he did go to the Arctic uh, to learn about what's happening in the Arctic and how it's affecting the people of the Arctic. And the, the, the end of his trip was um, uh, to participate briefly in the, the Glacier Conference in Anchorage, where, which had brought together um, a very diverse audience, including foreign ministers of many countries. To, to discuss the changing Arctic and the implications for the rest of the world. So I think, it's, I think I can say with a straight face, confidently, that 
um, during the Obama administration, um, Arctic science, Arctic research, um, it had an impact on policy. Not least the recognition at the highest levels of our government at that time that the Arctic matters and that we need to be, um, we need to be doing more in a whole of government approach. And that's where the national strategy for the Arctic region came from, to, to get the 25 government departments and agencies who are active in Alaska alone working together to find solutions, um, mitigation, resilience, sustainability solutions to, in response to the changes happening in the Arctic. During the Current administration, um, let's just say the level of activity has declined a little. I think we've, we've uh, reached the end of our time, but I, I want to thank Martin first for his presentation, but also for the invitation and the, and the realization that there's so much more that Dartmouth and Crow can do together. We know the urgency of the problem, the rate of acceleration of change in the Arctic. We have tremendous resources in this community. We have the Institute of Arctic Studies. We have Crell. We have Thayer. We have the academic departments here. But most importantly, we have these amazing students, undergraduates and graduate students, who are the future leaders for solving these problems. So we look forward to working more with you and with Crell, and we thank everyone for being here. And if you're interested in these topics, uh, please get on the Institute of Arctic Studies mailing list. Um, we have many other talks and seminars. Um, and Martin is now a member of the Hanover community, and welcome. And if you want to learn more about his work, you'll be able to, you know where to find him now. So once again, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. Thank you.